All right. So got a lot to go over. We're going over four categories of wellness, cardio, strength, nutrition, and flexibility. And squeezing all, I could talk for an hour and a half about any one of those four. So I'm going to zoom through it, but please feel free to ask questions. We're really open here. So if you have questions about stuff as we go through it. And this, if you went to part one, I see a few uh, folks that went to part one. This is sort of an advancement on knowledge. So if some of this stuff is a little bit further than you wanted to take it, the slides are available for the first part two. And if you didn't make it to that one, it, it'd be a good kind of introduction to this. So we're going to talk about what a star actually is for maintaining and not gaining. Uh, maintain, don't gain is a pretty common term used around the holidays to sort of try to maintain your current weight. As we all know, it's kind of tough through the holiday season to do that. So that's, that's the name of the, the sessions. Um, so today with the flexibility, we're going to go over a dynamic warm-up versus static stretching and a little bit about yoga. Um, we're going to go over nutrition, specifically eating for nutrient density, which is a really cool thing I'll, I want to share. Cardio training, we're going to talk about uh, interval training versus <coughs> set pace or running at the same speed. And then metabolic conditioning. And also strength training, of course, doing supersets with opposing muscle groups and mu metabolic conditioning with that as well. So... So what a star is, basically it just was something I came up with to be a star for the holidays, focusing on these four categories of wellness, stretching, treats is kind of tongue-in-cheek, we want to avoid uh, the non-healthy treats at least, aerobic training and resistance training. So first we're going to go over stretching and flexibility, and again the first series we talked about the basics of why do stretching, what does it do for you. And today we're going to talk about different types of stretching and, and how um, you might use these in your workouts. Anybody do stretching at all on their own? A few of you? Okay, good. So there's been some really neat research recently uh, done out at Cal State Fullerton. And they're looking at advantages to doing dynamic style warm-ups before, hi, before uh, your workouts as opposed to doing static stretching. Static stretching is, oh, I want to stretch my quadriceps, so I'm going to, like we talked about last time, I'm going to engage my abdomen and my glutes, pull back my foot, and try to stretch my quadricep. Hold for 30 seconds and then switch. That's static or a non-moving stretch. Dynamic stretching is different. We'll go over that in a second. What they're saying is static stretching has been shown to possibly decrease force production, how much force output you can do with those muscles, and it can decrease torque in the stretched limb but also the unstretched limb. So let's say I stretched my quadricep, held 30 seconds, and then went and did squats. I'm going to have decreased force production, decreased torque in both legs. Isn't that weird? And w what that means is that it's a neural response. When you, when you do a stretch, you have a neural response. Your body shuts down a little bit of force production in your muscle groups that you stretch, and the non-stretch. So it's kind of neat. So when they found that out, it was just what they were working with athletes. They were trying to say, okay, is static stretching before we go have these athletes perform, is that really something that's helpful? And they think, perhaps not. Now, with that said, if you're just getting back into working out and you're wondering, should I stretch before I work out or should I not, Paul says it decreases force production, yes, stretch. If you're not sure, warm up and stretch, do what you know how to do. This is an advanced version, so if you're already stretching and you're looking for that extra repetition, just a change, um, extra weight on a, on a set or something, this is a, has been shown to be a little bit of an advancement. So they actually did this study, and I won't read through all the boring details, probably not many of you are uh, scientists, dorks like me that like this kind of stuff, but it, it just shows they, they used an EMG and an MMG, and they showed that the rectus femoris muscle, this big muscle in the leg, and the vastus lateralis muscles were actually reduced in force production when they did static stretches. And they were doing that on athletes. So again, is it is it advantageous to prevent injuries? We don't really know yet, um, but it's certainly better as far as performance. So what is a dynamic warm-up? So we talked about this is static. I hold it for 30 seconds. I get a stretch in my quadricep. What is dynamic? <clears throat> Alternating quadricep pulls that first one on there. This is a dynamic type of stretch. So I'm going through a movement pattern. And this is great for athletes because what does an athlete do? An athlete doesn't go like this unless there's a sport that I don't know about. And we talked about last time, we're all athletes. We all have to move up and down from the couch. We all do squats and lunges. We all are 3D. We all move around in 3D. We're not in two dimension, one dimension. So doing dynamic types of things like this, no matter what you do, if you move around during your day, these are great for you. So dynamic quad pulls, 
this is alternating. What I'm doing is I'm increasing blood flow through my lower body, and I'm getting it prepared for what it's actually going to be doing, which is activity. Same thing, another example is alternating toe touches. This is a static toe touch. I'm sure you've all seen these before. And this is a more dynamic style. So, say I'm a soccer player. Isn't that a pretty good dynamic warm-up for what I'm going to be doing? Or from a football player, and I'm going to be running. That's a really good dynamic warm-up. So if you watch sports <coughs> and you watch athletes warm up, you're going to notice that they're doing a lot of dynamic things like this, especially if they're in the know. So I have a full dynamic warm-up on our YouTube page, the Health Quest YouTube page, <coughs> so you can see all of these and more on there. And I'm actually adding the advanced workouts that I'm going to talk about today soon. With the break coming up, I'll finally have time to go down to my basement and record some more videos. There's a really basic stretching uh, video down there uh, right now, a dynamic warm-up and a basic full body workout. So if you're just getting back into it, it's a really appropriate workout to start with. <clears throat> yoga is fantastic. I don't know if any of you in here have ever tried it or done a few yoga exercises. Oh my goodness. I got turned on to it about three years ago because I was always injured. I was working out all the time, teaching fitness classes all the time, and playing sports, and I was just beat up. And uh, one of my instructors, uh, the wellness program was running, it was a fantastic, she called it yoga lattes. It was a combination of yoga and Pilates, if you heard of it. And uh, I tell you what, after the first two classes, I had to go on a plane ride. And I'm always a mess on the plane. I just, I never can get comfortable. My hips hurt, my back hurts, blah, blah, blah. And uh, just after two yoga classes, I was perfectly fine. And I was totally sold. Um, so the obvious uh, benefits of it are uh, the range of motion is increased. It, it helps prevent injury provision. A lot of athletes are doing yoga, um, especially in the off-season. It reduces stress, reduces joint pain, uh, limitless uh, benefits of it. What I found most interesting, though, was increased body awareness, increased proprioception, knowing where your limbs are in space. It really does help with that. Um, a, a good yoga stretch um, is called the, well, does anybody know what this is called for fun? It's, I don't know why some of these yoga names are named what they are, but they're, it's kind of fun. That's called the pigeon. Uh, I haven't seen a pigeon do that, but they very well could. I'm sure there was a good reason for that. That is my favorite yoga stretch. Now, I do not look like this when I do it. Um, I am not able to bring my foot that far forward, but the stretch through the hips and glutes is just, it's just amazing. It's, it's life-changing, actually, because uh, I've had clients do that that have uh, if issues with their hips and they get piriformis syndrome, which is that really small muscle deep into the glutes that's hard to get to with massage and stuff, and that stretch is really helpful. So, Yoga, uh, this is a nice website. It shows pictures of a lot of different yoga exercises, but um, most yoga studios are very reasonable. Uh, if you're interested in getting more flexible, more range of motion, or... Uh, reducing injuries, uh, I would suggest going to an instructor at least for a few times and learning the basics and then trying to take off on a video or using a page like this. So, and I'm also going to do a little Yoga Lottie's video too. Uh, any questions about flexibility, um, range of motion, any of that stuff? Okay. So I got a lot of slides on nutrition. I want to zoom through them so I get through everything. But I think... Americans are focusing too much on what not to eat. I think that's an issue. I think we are not focusing enough on what we should eat, which is uh, nutrients. We want to focus on what we're taking in nutrient-wise. So don't eat saturated fat, don't eat chips, don't eat french fries. We've all heard it. I mean, that, I, I would be talking to you for the 100 millionth time about not to do that. I mean, you guys know. So let's think about what we should actually take in. What are we nutrient poor and we're nutrient poor in basic vitamins and minerals. Um, you might be on a low fat diet but if you're not taking in the basic vitamins and minerals and water that you need, you might be limiting whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So magnesium, calcium, potassium, vitamins A, C, and E are all really, really low in the general American diet. And that's according to a study that was done uh, relatively recently. So nutrient rich foods are what we're going to focus on. Also, I'll use the word nutrient-rich and nutrient-dense nutrient and is uh, the same, same type of thing. So we want to eat more fruits, more vegetables. That's probably not news to anybody. We've probably heard that about 100 million times too, right? Low-fat dairy and whole grains. That's all nutrient density is. If you focus on eating those types of foods, you will make progress in, with your wellness. They did a study recently. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have the study up here. But they had 97 um, obese females. 
they had one group focusing, they had a control group of course, they had one group uh, focused on eating nutrient rich foods, and they also had another group focusing just on their fat consumption, trying to eat just low fat foods. And the group that ate nutrient rich foods lost an average of 17 pounds in one year. Pretty darn good. And that's just focusing on eating nutrient rich foods, more vitamins, uh, or excuse me, more fruits, more vegetables, low fat dairy, and whole grains. So get more nutrients for your calories. If you're eating something, think, is it nutrient dense? We'll talk more about examples of that in a second. My wife works for a uh, pet food company. Uh, we're not too far away from here, I won't name it. <laughs> but uh, they're a very nutritious pet food. And uh, I like the examples that I've heard her talk about with her job, where some of the lower grade pet foods don't have very good materials in them, and the animals don't stay uh, full for very long, and so they have to feed them a lot more. Well, this pet food is more expensive, but the advantage to it is you don't have to feed them as much because it's nutrient dense. Exactly. Well, why not do that with humans, right? Um, the neat thing about pets is you can, you can feed them the perfect diet. You feed them two cups or whatever, whatever is appropriate for that animal. And they can, they can be on a perfect diet. So you can do something similar for yourself. More fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are very, very high in fiber. Uh, a study recently done in Sweden shows that you can greatly increase your weight loss because it helps keep you satiated. It turns on that PYY hormone that tells your brain that you're full, so is protein. And it also helps, this is cool, it also helps reduce fat absorption. Your body uh, assimilates fat um, for energy, and so it makes that process a little bit more efficient, eating fruits and vegetables. So here's just some examples of vegetables that are high in fiber, fruits that are high in fiber, and other high fiber foods, whole grains mostly. Uh, they can get in cereals and breads and that kind of stuff. Uh, I also included in your handout a nutrient-rich meal plan. It's probably pretty small in there, so if you're interested in seeing that, uh, I'd be happy to send it to you. And uh, if you came to the first part of the series, what do you notice about the number of meals there in portions? Small portions often, yeah. So keeping our blood sugar level moderated is the first step. If that's a struggle for you, if you're a one to two meal a day person, I would try to just eat small portions often first and then maybe move to a nutrient rich meal plan, get, get a little more cute with it and look at some of these things. And my favorite post workout is chocolate milk. Low fat chocolate milk, they did a study against uh, Endorox R4 and Gatorade, and chocolate milk beat it out hands down as far as recovery because it has uh, all your branched chain amino acids, uh, complex carbs, simple sugar carbs, and tons of protein. Uh, low fat though, low fat. 